I know that uh, just like so you can feel the, the buzz in the room, so um, I know that this is the culmination of quite a day, and uh, Henry and I had the opportunity of participating for part of the afternoon, and I have to say that we were just so thrilled to see uh, how many students had been involved in organizing this day and how many students participated and also that we had most of our past recipients here as uh, Pamela Gann told you in her introductory rem remarks. And I want to thank Pamela because it was her idea to bring this to campus. And you mentioned that this is a, a leadership place. Well, you showed leadership in, in this effort and thank you very much and I think it's really wonderful. Uh, I was going to say it's really wonderful that the school has embraced the not-for-profit world in the way that it has and really integrated it in the life of the school. And so um, for that, we thank you. And I want to thank Harry, who's the, the, uh, the chair, uh, for all his support, not only in making that happen here at the school, but also your role uh, at, in the selection committee. So Harry, thank you very much. As uh, Pamela mentioned, we have two outstanding uh, honorees this evening. And uh, we have two not because we couldn't make up our minds. Uh, we have two because the selection committee just felt so strongly. We weren't a divided group. It wasn't a compromise solution at all. We just felt so strongly that we had two extremely deserving and impressive and transformative uh, organizations that we wanted to highlight. And um, I think I've explained, many of you have been to these dinners before, but just so we can recap how we uh, come to this choice, the uh, um, selection committee uh, receives a large number of nominations from both from anonymous non nominators and also from the website. And there's one person who unfortunately is not here this evening, Kim Yonker. Unfortunately, she's ill, and I hope if she's listening, because she, today she was um, watching uh, this, the proceedings online. I hope, Kim, that if you're hearing us, you'll know how much we appreciate everything you do and how much we applaud the rigor with which you, you do your work and also the commitment that you have, not only to the Kravis Prize, but to the, to the, um, the recipients. She works with them throughout the year and continues to maintain that network. And she does it with, uh, with such passion that we thank her very much. So with Kim and, and her team, uh, they do a first, just a first verification and a first appraisal of the nominations that we receive. And we usually present to the selection committee uh, roughly 10 uh, organizations uh, for review. And when we review them, we really try to focus on, on their impact and on results. It's not a question of honoring the largest organization, or the one with the biggest um, budget, or uh, the one with the biggest ambitions, but we really want to reward the, one with the, the ones with the biggest impact and uh, the most meaningful and measurable results. And I was saying this afternoon and speaking to the students that it's, a, it's not a perfect process and I don't think it ever will be because so many of the, the impacts and the effects are not quantifiable. But we're trying to be as current as we can in the methodology of evaluation and in doing so, uh, trying to measure those impacts as, as best we can but the idea is really to, to focus and to reward results. And this year, uh, the selection committee just found that there were two organizations that were just so compelling that we had to reward them, and it's an exceptional year, and maybe that's why we're also on campus. That's an exceptional, an exceptional event. But I'd like to talk to you just very briefly about these two organizations. And I'm going to do so, maybe not in describing them in detail, but I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you to imagine a situation. Imagine that you're in South Africa, and the prevalence of HIV AIDS is about 
as opposed to an average, I think, of about 6% in Africa, 1% in the world. And you're in an environment that provides very little social or political support for dealing with HIV AIDS. Uh, the political leadership is virtually in denial, um, trying to question the science of transmission of the HIV virus to AIDS, um, and, and really um, refusing to acknowledge the very deep problem uh, that is afflicting that society. So just imagine that you're in 2001, and you're dealing with this huge problem, not recognized by government. It's a real taboo uh, in society, a problem that people want to keep hidden. And you decide that you're going to tackle it by reducing or preventing the transmission of HIV from mothers to their children. And it's doable through medication. It's doable through coaching with regard to breastfeeding and how you take care of your children. It's doable, but think about it. It's, you're going against all odds. And not only do you do it in that country, but then you extend it to neighboring countries and to a whole continent. So need I say more? Just, just imagine. So I take you then uh, from the efforts of Robin Smalley and, and Jean Falk to another part of, of Africa, <laughs> to Northern Africa, and I take you to, to Jordan. And again, I ask you to imagine uh, you're in a country that has no entrepreneurial ecosystem, no, um, or virtually no teaching of business in Arabic, uh, very few we, Arabic textbooks on business. Today, there were many references to Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker has never been translated in Arabic. Um, and not only Peter Drucker, but a number of, of uh, economists that we could name from uh, North America, from Western Europe. But that not only doesn't have that ecosystem of entrepreneurship, but doesn't also have a tradition of volunteerism and um, where in Jordan, I just found out that women's part participation rate, labor participation rate is only 11%. And here you are, a young woman, and you decide to take on, through the Ministry of Education, to take on the task of creating a culture of volunteerism and of links between the private sector and um, young, untrained, unemployed uh, youth, or I shouldn't say young youth, <laughs> young people. And again, you're dealing in a context where 70% of the population is under 30, where youth unemployment rates are, can reach 50%. Uh, and you decide that you're going to work with the private sector and convince them that they are going to not only provide volunteers to work with these young people and teach them entrepreneurial skills, but you're also going to convince them to take them on as interns and to give them a work experience. So think of the odds of that situation succeeding. And today we honor with Saraya Salti and Injaz the success that has reached 100,000 youth in in Jordan, but that has now spread also to neighboring countries, Tunisia, uh, Morocco, uh, the, Palest um, the Palestinian, uh, the West Bank and Gaza, uh, the uh, Gulf countries, the six Gulf countries, Lebanon, Egypt. Just think of the conditions under which such a scenario is possible. I think the only, the only answer is the, not only the boldness and the visionary uh, commitment of these individuals, but it's, it's persistence, it's charm also, <laughs> we have to say it, it's powers of persuasion, 
but uh, it's really this willingness to change a culture, to change the culture of a nation, to change the culture of a region. And that is what convinced the selection committee that these two groups, as different as they were, working in completely different areas, really deserved our support. And I welcome tonight, I think Jean will um, speak on behalf of Mothers to Mother, uh, Jean and Soraya Salty on behalf of Injaz. I welcome you both, and uh, we're dying to hear from you, and bravo. <laughs> seen Soraya and heard her speak, I'm very glad that I got to go first. <laughs> it's a really hard act to follow. Um, and, and in a different light, I have to say I'm um, honored to be recognized at the same time and on the same stage as Soraya Salty, who is doing just extraordinary work. So um, thank you for the work you're doing. Um, some other thank yous that are very important. Uh, first, of course, to everyone in the college community. Um, this has been a remarkable experience, fun, in a way that I just never expected, challenging and interesting. Um, President Gann, thank you. Um, faculty and the staff who've helped us and contributed to our time here. Um, to Kim, who's not here, wherever you are. To Dot, who is here. Um, and got us through this, and to all the students who've served as our guides and our hosts. It's just been amazing, and uh, we greatly appreciate it. Um, thank you to the selection committee, otherwise we wouldn't be standing here. Um, Harry, we appreciate it. Mrs. Kravis, uh, we can't tell you how much we appreciate it. And, <laughs> to con and, and thank you, of course, to Mr. and Mrs. Kravis for making this possible in so many ways. And it's an extraordinary kind of recognition, and I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Um, I want to start this way. I just want you to think for a minute. Sometimes I do this as audience participation, but tonight, just for, for, to keep it fast, just think. Give me, give, give me an estimate in your head. How many kids do you think were born with HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, in the US last year? Okay, give you a couple of seconds. And there's a range, could it, is it, is it 10,000, is it 100,000? The answer is less than 100. Less than 100 kids born in the US last year. That's not even one baby a day. While in Africa, every day, more than 1,000 children are born with the virus that causes AIDS. And most of them are going to die before they reach the age of two. This is a massive tragedy, and it's completely preventable. In fact, a pregnant woman living with HIV can take a single pill when she goes into labor, and it will reduce by 50% the likelihood of her transmitting the virus to her child. One pill cut transmission in half. Or if she starts on a similar regimen a few months earlier, you can virtually eliminate the likelihood that her baby will be infected. It is that simple. And the treatment to prevent mother-to-child transmission of H HIV has become not only that simple, but that inexpensive and that effective that some version of it is already available in most of Africa. But you still have those numbers. Nearly 400,000 children infected via mother-to-child transmission every year. Now, why? What's the incongruity here? Well, first, there's the reality of medical systems in the developing world. They were struggling to stay afloat even before the flood of AIDS casualties hit them in the 90s and through the last 20 years. And now, there simply aren't close to enough doctors or nurses or any kind of medical professionals to meet the demands of even the most basic medical care. 
And then there are the very specific issues facing a pregnant woman living with HIV. It's a set of obstacles that would be challenging in the best of circumstances. The lack of widespread knowledge and information about the virus, about the treatment possibilities, discrimination against people with HIV, and the very practical and real day-to-day -day consequences of the stigma that is associated with HIV, even in places where huge percentages of people have the virus. Stigma is something that kills. It's not just a psychological issue. It's an issue where you go home and people know that you have HIV and you may be beaten to death. You may be thrown out of your house in a communal society, which leaves you and any other children you have on the street. So add to all of these challenges the everyday social and economic barriers that most women face in African societies, and you begin to understand the challenges you face in enrolling and retaining a woman, a pregnant woman, in a program of treatment and care. Let me tell you a story. Let me ask you to imagine, once again, a young woman in Africa. She spent hours walking to get to a clinic and more hours waiting in line in a hot sun so that she can see a doctor, but she's happy. She's excited because she's pretty certain that she's going to have her first child. And eventually she does get to see this doctor and the doctor confirms her very happy news. And then he asks, did you know you have HIV? And then the doctor goes on to tell her that there's treatment, that she's healthy, that she's not likely to get sick soon. Her baby can be fine, but it doesn't matter because she can't hear any of that. What she hears is, I have AIDS. I'm going to die. My baby is going to die. It doesn't go any further than that. And it becomes highly unlikely that she'll be able to take the steps that are needed to preserve her baby's health or her own. At Mothers to Mothers, our mission has been to change that story. How? Well, at the basic level, it's very, very simple. It's about nothing more than a woman speaking to another woman. But then we leverage that interaction. We hire local women who themselves have been through the treatment to prevent mother-child transmission. And then they are trained extensively so that they become experts on HIV, on treatment, and on care. They're employed, and that means paid. And then they return to the clinics in their local communities. We call them mentor mothers, and they are the backbone of our program. It's heart and soul, and it's leadership. Our mentor mothers work in their local clinics as professional members of health delivery teams. They serve alongside doctors and nurses. They help fill those gaps in understaffed health facilities. They provide unique leadership for their peers. They're the sources of education, support, inspiration, and they're living proof that a diagnosis of HIV is anything but a death sentence. Important they become role models, and they become leaders to their clients, to their patients, and to their communities. They can draw on their new learning and their skills, but just as importantly, they rely on their life experience. Their mandate is to ensure that every HIV-positive woman, pregnant, I'm sorry, every HIV-positive pregnant woman and every HIV-positive new mother will access the care and support that's available to prevent the transmission of the virus from mothers to children and to sustain the mother's and the infant's help. They, cre they create demonstrable change. It's measurable and it's measured. Improvements in key outcomes from treatment uptake to behavioral and attitudinal changes. 
Our mentor mothers work in societies where jobs are not easy to come by. Formal employment opportunities for women are even more rare. Perversely, this provides our program with some significant benefits because we can draw on the most underutilized resource in the developing world. We have picked the first pick in the best talent pool available, the women of the developing world. For most of our mentor mothers, this means it's their first formal job. But giving them a chance, giving them real responsibility, insisting on accountability while also insisting on fair compensation for their efforts, empowers our staff. It empowers them personally, economically, and professionally, and this allows them to lead. So let's look at the story I told you before through a different lens. The young woman comes in, but in, when she hears about her status from the doctor, instead of the doctor continuing to try to explain what's going to happen, she gets introduced to a mentor mother, a woman who looks like her, who speaks her language, who comes from her community. And she says, and our mentor mother says, Sisi, I have HIV. A year ago, I was where you are. I'm not sick, I'm healthy, I'm strong, and my baby is HIV negative. Come with me, let me help you. The mentor mother can provide her with technical information one-on-one, -on -one, can answer questions that she would be afraid to ask, or she can introduce her to a large group of other women and support groups, both formal and informal, women like her struggling with the same issues. And at the end of the day, when all is said and done, it's still just about a woman talking to another woman. But the difference between this, these two stories, the impact, is literally the difference between sickness and health, between life and death. The very simplicity of that exchange was the key to ensuring that our model was not only effective, but it could be replicated and scaled rapidly to meet an emergency situation. We started 10 years ago with just a handful of clinics around, in just a handful of clinics around Cape Town, and now, now we're in more than 700 locations in nine countries. We reach nearly 300,000 HIV positive women every year. That's nearly one out of five of the affected population in the world. At a cost of less than $75 per beneficiary, and most of that money stays in local communities paying the salaries of the more than 1,700 women, mothers living with HIV, whom we employ. This is a cadre of healthcare workers who wouldn't otherwise be employed who probably otherwise wouldn't be alive, much less serving as the key healthcare workers in preventing transmission to others. When we began our program over 10 years ago, we faced a lot of issues, as Mrs. Kravis mentioned. Um, some of them were from the South African government and their complete denial of the reality of HIV and AIDS, and their almost assertive refusal to allow treatment. But some of them were from within the public health community and the donor community who thought we were crazy. The concept of professionalizing unskilled mothers to work as part of the medical system was treated as something that might never happen. And the notion of paying our staff for their work was considered, quote, unsustainable. We were told that time and again. But now, I'm really proud to say that we've begun to change that accepted wisdom. I guess begun is probably, I guess it's more than begun at this point. Well, that accepted wisdom is changing and our model is becoming accepted as the mainstream approach for delivering improved service to prevent mother-to-child transmission and keep mothers and babies healthy through the developing world. 
That presents both an opportunity for us and a challenge. The opportunity is that in June 2011, uh, under the auspices of the UN, world leaders launched a program to eliminate new infections of HIV among children by 2015. It's eradicating new cases of pediatric AIDS within the next three to five years. This is commonly known as the global plan. And the notion that we could do this in this limited period of time is a very ambitious goal. Mothers to Mothers was asked to participate in the drafting of the plan and the, the thinking of the plan. But nonetheless, so were many other organizations. And we were both shocked and, and, and thrilled when the plan was published and we read that our innovations and that the concept of the mentor mothers were written in as a backbone of the effort that's coming up. The plan says that countries must harness the capacity of communities by involving mentor mothers. A mother living with HIV who is trained and employed as part of a medical team to support, educate, and empower pregnant women and new mothers about their health and their baby's health. That's a long way to go in 10 years. But the challenge is that there are now 22 countries identified in that plan that make up 95% of the burden of the HIV positive pregnant women in the world. We're in seven or nine of them now, depends how you count. And our challenge is to figure out how to provide service to all 22 of those. Not only that, how to integrate that service with existing government programs so that it's not us coming in and operating uh, our program, but it's mentor mothers who exist throughout healthcare systems in sub-Saharan Africa. It's daunting. But what an opportunity. What a legacy we could leave. At Mothers to Mothers, we've been particularly proud to be recognized with the Kravis Award, Kravis Prize, excuse me, um, because it celebrates leadership and innovation. Now, this is, a, this is an educational institution that celebrates leadership and that focuses on it. But we all know that it's an intangible quality. And we also know that with leadership, a simple idea, perhaps nothing more than a vision, can grow to have an extraordinary impact. And we're particularly proud because we staked our future on the notion that leaders exist far beyond the walls of formal institutions, and that leadership does not have to come from the top down. In our organization, it's not just inspiration, but it's leadership that comes from our mentor mothers. I too am gonna to quote Peter Drucker. Um, famously, he said, management is doing things right, leadership is doing the right things. The thousands of women who have served as mentor mothers have shown us how to do the right things again and again and have shown us that they can do it themselves better than anyone else possibly could. This is why we have faith that in spite of the hurdles and in spite of the enormity of the challenge, that the UN and the leaders of the world are right. And that in the next several years, we can put an end to this gross inequity and tragedy. We can eliminate new cases of pediatric AIDS. And it's all because we do believe in leadership and we believe in the leadership of the mentor mothers who from the start have been what Mothers to Mothers is about. On that note, again, I would like to thank Mr. and Mrs. Kravis for the recognition, for the funding that comes with recognition that will allow us to take the next step and 
enter into this new world and to see if we truly can achieve the goal that we started out to, as a, as a very um, distant goal, but something that we believed we could do 10 years ago. So thank you both so much. And thank you all for listening. Sir. And now we're going to uh, ask uh, Soraya Salty to come up from Injaz, and uh, she's got a great story to tell. We'll be uh, fascinated to hear it. Soraya. As an Arab, I thought we had a monopoly over hospitality until I landed in Claremont McKenna, McKenna <laughs> University. <laughs> Thank you so much for your warm hospitality. It's been a phenomenal two days and an experience of a lifetime. And thank you for this fabulous award. You've spoiled us <laughs> not to have to write a grant and just to receive a phone call saying, you've won $250,000, where did you come from? Of course, Claremont McKenna and the Kravis Award. So thank you for an extraordinary, there's nothing better than to, to celebrate. And here we are. Uh, so, youth uh, are the new face of the Arab world, and they're actually defining our region. If you've watched TV, and I'm sure you have, you've seen how they've gone to the streets, they've gone to the squares, and they've, they've shaken our very systems for one reason, unemployment, youth marginalized, and Jubran Khalil Jubran, our very famous philosopher, Lebanese, I think he would be heartbroken to see what we've seen in the last year. And I am heartbroken, working 10 years trying to prevent what happened of despair, that you would go to the streets and, and uh, in helplessness uh, because of an issue, because you're not part of the cycle of life. And I want to just say the, the few words that Khalil Jubran said about this. You work that you may keep pace with the earth and the soul of the earth. For to be idle is to become a stranger unto the seasons, and to step out of life's procession that marches in majesty. So in the backdrop of my region and the youth unemployment uh, crisis, 350 million Arabs, 200 million are youth, 70% of our population. If you just want to hear just some of the statistics uh, of youth unemployed, Tunisia, 25%. And we thought, you know, we would, were never expecting anything to happen in Tunisia with just 25% youth unemployment. It's pretty high if you think of it here in the U.S., but from our perspective, what's 25% when in Egypt youth unemployment was 44%? And it took a university graduate five years to find their first job. In Syria, uh, youth unemployment, 49%. In Iraq, 60%. In Yemen, 71%. And in Saudi Arabia, not one oil producing country is immune, 23%. With the female's severest hit, if those were the averages in the countries, then you can expect uh, only 23% of females actually make it into the labor market. Education systems that have failed their youth if coming, coming out, experts in memorization, and yet missing the critical thinking, problem solving, leadership skills that this institution believes so strongly in. And then when the private sector were asked, what are the number one hindrance to your growth? It was the lack of human resources. So in a region that has the highest youth unemployment, the hindrance of private sector to grow was the lack of human re resources. And they termed them the new illiterates, those that know, that know how to read and write, but don't know how to maneuver in the private sector. So 
when your own people and when your own youth become your national security threat, you know that the paradigm must shift. And you know that employability and, and the future employment of the youth in your country has to become the top priority. And America has taught us so well what the entrepreneurial spirit creates and the type of corporations it generates and the type of employment that it, that it creates. And it's a paradigm shift that we communicate that entrepreneurship and startup creation is the solution and SMEs are the solution to solving this issue across the region. So we've built uh, an organization based on partnership and based on active participation and leadership of the three pillars that the president spoke earlier about, which are the civil society, private sector, and government coming together to solve it. In our region, ministries of education have been closed for decades. So to have a volunteer from the private sector walking in took much maneuvering. And the private sector wasn't much easier <laughs> to maneuver to get them involved. And I wanted just to share a personal story of how finally we, you know, a Jordanian wanting to grow the organization from Jordan across the Arab world. Luckily, fortunately, our inspired king has the World Economic Forum on the Dead Sea. <laughs> And so, of course, we're going to bank on that. So uh, I lobbied so uh, adamantly, State Department, USAID, uh, Minister Bassem Abdullah, who was leading the forum, to say, please get me in. I would like to be a speaker to speak about the youth issues, and the youth bulge, they called it then. And of course, no response, no response. Well, then I get this uh, call from a, a friend who had just started a magazine called Joe Magazine. Now it's doing quite well, but by then it was maybe their second or third edition. And the lady said, since you're going regional now and you've had such a success story in Jordan, we'd like to cover you and we'd like to have you on the cover of Joe Magazine. I said, fantastic, except only under one condition, that it's the May edition. They didn't know what the May edition was. Of course, the May edition is the World Economic Forum edition. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I wasn't going to pay, you know, uh, to participate in the world economy. I was trying to get in for free, but I thought if I pay this one time, I will never ever pay again. <laughs> so I'm in Joe Magazine, however, it's a new edition. Nobody takes Joe Magazine. So I start calling all the hotel owners saying, you've helped me so much with all the volunteers that you've given me for Jordan. Now you're going to help me go regional and I need the World Economic Forum. So here are the boxes, they're arriving three days. Every room, every participant, World Economic Forum has to have a magazine in there <laughs> on their table. So I walk into the World Economic Forum, of course, and uh, I'm getting these businesses. Say, I know you, yes, I know you too. <laughs> so, and, uh, Seven years later, 250 board members that I have, I banked on the World Economic Forum list and went and f I follow them. They go to the Marrakesh, our regional competition happens to be in Marrakesh on the same day. <laughs> and we invite all the forum members. So even those, car you know, there's a way around them. And so fortunately using private sector, nimble, very quick on the take and capable to mobilize. You get the ringleader and you got them all. So, yeah. so where we are today is uh, 1,000 corporate partners, <laughs> 24,000 volunteers, and a million youth that we've reached across the Arab world, 15 countries, 15 ministries of education. We're the only nonprofit that's been able to crack the ministries of education. That's another story later. <laughs> but in any case, the most inspiring moment has been uh, working with youth for 10 years and then suddenly seeing them wake up to their potential it was through the Arab Spring. They were beneficiaries, you know, they were waiting for things to happen to them. My dad's gonna marry me, my government's going to employ me, and then suddenly they topple the government, they go to Tahrir Square, girls and boys. One of our students who were studying our alumni, she left a note, covered completely, left a note to her parents saying, I'm off to Tahrir Square, I'll see you later, don't worry about me, and she came back 17 days later, and she said, I arrived to my home and I was an adult, <laughs> you know. They were talking to me like I was an equal. 
a, tw- a 19 year old girl and um, just being witness to that strength so all of a sudden they became our partners instead of our beneficiaries so I give you an example. We are teaching entrepreneurship in Egypt. Across, uh, we had 50 student enterprises right after the Arab Spring. And we tried to you know, support them as much as possible after the universities were closed. And the one team in Tanta, which is you know, in the furthest corner, you can't imagine the area that this team came out with, they saw this entrepreneurial venture that we were looking at as educational. They were looking at it as my only means to an economic future. So they went out and started registering legally this entrepreneurial venture. Well, across the region, bankruptcy means going to jail. So we were so worried because we didn't want to take the responsibility. What if they go bankrupt? So we immediately went back to our corporate partners and said, we really need to support them going into the next phase. And what we're seeing today is from Tahrir Square, going, you know, channeling their energy to an entrepreneurship revolution. And we need you, private sector, to step up just like the youth have stepped up. And so today we've convinced them that their um, board meetings, where they hold their board meetings, should be the incubator for our startups. So those that they choose go into the board meetings. And for six months, their CSR activity is to invest and support through the various departments, the startups, that we, that, um, and the job creation that comes out at the end. The most, uh, the moment that I felt so proud was in 2007. Uh, this uh, Palestinian girl from Ramallah, her name is Wa'd al-Tawil, the long-awaited promise. And it was this long-awaited promise that a young girl, 17-year-old, comes to our regional competition, and for the very first time, we've got a region and seven countries participating, and she wins the best student company of the year. Well, we thought it was a phenomenal. Okay, the next year comes, and the top teams from across the region are all female teams. Well, they've never lost a single competition since. We've held the last five. This last year, 12 teams participating, which means national winners in every country, and schools are segregated. So it means the boys are competing head on against the girls. We had eight teams girls. Two, uh, team nine and 10, were co-ed because there are co-ed schools in Lebanon and, uh, and in Morocco and only two boys' teams. And of course, first place, second place, third place, all girls' teams, Saudi Arabia, the girls' teams, for the first time, they're allowed to travel, and they got second place in 2011. I didn't understand the phenomena, but I was living it, and then I started to understand. The grandmother was illiterate, the mother was literate, but this generation of 15 to 21 year olds were 60% of all university graduates. And so when I read this report from Booz in 2012, they finally got it, and this is what it said. Women are more highly educated than the overall population, constituting 60% of all university graduates. Bringing more women into the workforce can give companies a competitive edge. (laughs) Good morning, booze, but finally. (laughs) What we were living and experiencing is now aligned (laughs) with the competitiveness of the private sector. On behalf of our, my Injaz colleagues, on behalf of my corporate partners, on behalf of the youth that we serve, I can't be more grateful to you than for you to invest as the Kravis Award in the young shapers of the Arab world. I believe in them and my bet is on them, especially on the young females. And thank you for this wonderful award.
Well, those two uh, talks were uh, without a doubt inspiring. Now, if you want to think about entrepreneurship or you want to think about leadership, just think about tonight and think about those two uh, leaders because it's a great description of what leadership's all about. And when I heard the story that Soraya just told about Joe Magazine, I will always remember that now. <laughs> all of you students in this room that have an idea, there's no excuse. Get your picture on the magazine. <laughs> <clears throat> and as I sat in a couple of the sessions this afternoon with Mary Jose, uh, I started thinking, here we have seven of the eight prize winners were able to come to the school, the, the two uh, current ones for this year, and five others. And we were, we're blessed, Mary Jose and I, in, in that we picked uh, really terrific people to, to take on uh, this, this prize. But, and as I think about the leadership in every one of these organizations, starting with Roy Prosterman, who, when I'll never forget calling him, and he didn't know me from Adam, he took the call and I said, would you like to accept the Kravis Prize? Now there was no Kravis Prize at that point, he was gonna be it. He said, yeah, why not? You know, and he didn't ask me, he didn't say, well, how much is it, or where do I have to go, or anything. And I was so worried that he thought there was some kind of a scam <laughs> that, that I said, you know, you should really come and if you're going to be in New York. He said, well, I'm going to be in New York pretty soon. And I said, well, come by and, 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 and meet Mary Jose and me. You know, we're, we're real. Come, come meet us. <laughs> and he did. And that started us off, Roy. And, um, uh, and then we go through all the others that uh, have happened. And every time we, Mary Jose or I make one of those calls, uh, we're always worried. You know, we think, well, does anybody really know what the Kravis Prize is? But boy, they're happy to come. And, uh, and it's terrific. And Gene told me a story about, uh, about his nephew, who's a CMC freshman. And uh, Ben is here tonight with us. And uh, Ben had been talking to him about something. And he gets his call. And it, Mary Jose had actually called to uh, South Africa because that was the contact information we had and it turned out that the gene was actually in New York But by the time the the message got back to him was all garbled and the name Kravis didn't quite sound like Kravis anymore and and He thought that Ben was just trying to, to play a joke on him <laughs> But he had this number and it said call This number and sort of Mary Jose's name sort of came up out of it and he called back and next thing you know here we are, so uh, that's also a good lesson for all of you, call back. <laughs> but what I, I really want to do is, and, and I'm not going to take much time, but, but there's, there's several people that I really want to want to thank, and, and the first and foremost is, is my wife, Mary Jose, my partner, my best friend, wonderful, very special lady, who has really made the Kravis Prize what it is. She has worked very hard at it. She's worked very closely with Pamela. She's worked very closely with Kim Yonker to make sure that we had the right metrics, that we had the right measurement to, uh, to determine uh, the proper uh, recipients and, and uh, to make sure that we put together an incredible selection committee, which is You've heard her mention the people that are on it. I mean, it is second to none. And everyone is very involved and, and really helps us out. And so, Mary Jose, to you, thank you for everything you do for this. Thank you. Now, I will say this idea of a, of a prize and really goes back to something that, that was even more fundamental. It goes back probably 15, 16, 17 years ago when former president of CMC, Jack Stark, and I had a, a conversation. And uh, Jack came to see me in, in New York, and we got talking about different things that I might be able to do uh, for CMC, which I, I really wanted to do. And we got on to this discussion about 
uh, a leadership institute here. And uh, uh, we sort of designed it, and, and uh, we didn't know exactly what it would be, except that we wanted to have a leadership institute. We did not know that it would actually morph into uh, much more of a focus uh, as it has now on the not-for-profit. And it was a lot of trial and error when we got started. We'd have our meetings. We talked about a lot of different things. And, you know, can you make somebody a great leader? Can you not? And what you need to do and all those things. And the more I listened to it, it came upon me one day that I said, you know, if I, if I could and if I could wish on every university in this country to make it a requirement for, for the students to participate in the not-for-profit world, you wouldn't believe the kind of, of pleasure and, and fulfillment that you would get out of it. And I said, I'd like to really make it a requirement. Jack said, well, we can't make it a requirement here. I tried it at Harvard, and Neil Rudenstein, the president up there at the time, said, no, we can't make it a requirement. And, and I have to say, uh, Jack, I wasn't going to give up. We've come awfully close here without making it a requirement. And that leads me to, to the next person that I really want to, to thank, because it's been under Pamela Gann's leadership of, of CMC at this time that we've been able to take it to the step that it is today. And, and Pamela, you really got behind this, and you believed in what we were trying to do, and you, and you stood by us. And more importantly, you were able to uh, galvanize the board. You were able to galvanize the board of the uh, Kravis Leadership Institute to get those people to help uh, by providing summer internships and jobs, in many cases in the not-for-profit area. And today, I don't know the number exactly, Pamela, but all I know is it's a very high percentage of the students at CMC take advantage of it. And any of you students that are here tonight that have not taken advantage of it, I cannot urge you enough, take advantage of it because you will just love it. It'll be one of the best experiences that you'll ever have, and I think it will shape your life for a long time. And lastly, uh, I want to thank uh, Jay Conger uh, who, uh, and, and uh, Sarah Orr, who head up the Kravis Leadership Institute. Uh, they've really made it into what it is today. Uh, they've worked uh, very, very hard. You followed in Ron's footsteps, and he really set a terrific path uh, for building the Institute, and, and you've been able to uh, continue it on, and now in this not-for-profit mode and uh, showing people that they're leaders in all walks of life. I can't thank you enough, and I'm very proud to have my name on the Kravis Leadership with your uh, leadership of the Institute and the work that both of you are doing and that Ron's doing. And I want to thank all of you, and a round of applause to, to all three of you. And last, lastly, uh, I want to thank Harry McMahon. Harry's been a friend of mine for a long time, and uh, Harry got behind this effort. Uh, without the chairman of the board, without uh, the president of the college, it would not have happened. And I've already talked about Pamela, but, but let me just tell you that Harry has been my partner in this and has really stepped up to the plate, not only in financial giving, but more importantly in the support uh, an encouragement that he has given in building out the Kravis leadership and building out the other institutes at the, at the uh, college. And what a great job you've done as, as chairman. Harry, thank you very much. So lastly, thank all of you. Thank you for even having an interest in what we're trying to do in believing uh, in CMC in believing uh, that there is a better way and that there are other ways. I'll tell you that I have learned a lot by the whole process of the Kravis Prize. When I think about the nominations that come uh, from all over the world, I'm just, uh, I, I'm, I, as Mary Jose said it today, and she said it so well, uh, when asked uh, in an interview she did about one of the things about the Kravis Prize, and she said, I'm humbled. And I want to just second that because I have to tell you, I am very humbled when I see what all of you have done, whether it be down in, in, in Africa, in Guinea, with 
uh, the uh, Fawai and what you've done with uh, the uh, education for, uh, for, peop uh, for young uh, girls, uh, to what we heard about tonight, uh, to the uh, million people that have uh, land rights, uh, families that have land rights around the world from Roy Prosterman's uh, Rural Land Institute, uh, to Vicky's, Vicky Colbert's work down in uh, South America and in other countries on education again. Uh, I, I'm just, uh, I have to say, uh, really, it's so impressed with the work that's been done. And uh, we want to get to know more about what you're doing, and we'll, we're going to watch with great interest as you continue to grow. And I hope uh, this prize that we've given you will just be another step in a great long journey that all of you are going to have. Thanks very much.